You're listening to the listener-supported Paperback Warrior Podcast. Welcome to Paperback Warrior, episode number 41. We're a vintage paperback review and discussion show covering 20th century fiction in the crime, adventure, western, and espionage genres, as well as whatever else is tickling our fancy. We have a wildly popular website at paperbackwarrior.com where we post review and feature articles every day. You should follow us on Facebook to get daily alerts and join the conversation. Let me throw it over to Tom who's going to tell you about what we have in store for you today. Hey, thanks, Eric. Uh, On today's show, you're going to be doing a feature on Ross McDonald, one of the godfathers of uh, hard-boiled crime fiction. And uh, and you're going to be talking about both his Lou Archer series and some of his standalones. And I think you're also going to be reviewing the very first Lou Archer book, right, called The Moving Target? Correct. Okay, good. I'm going to be reviewing a book I teased a couple weeks ago called A Rage at Sea by Frederick Lawrence. And we're also going to be talking about our favorite books for the month that we read and reviewed for the month of April 2020. But first, you have a big programming announcement regarding the blog, right? That's right, Tom. So back in March, we had a huge backlog of reviews we had written that were sitting on ice waiting to be posted here on the Paperback Warrior blog. So we decided to begin posting two reviews per day, six days a week, to eat up that backlog. Now, obviously, when we made that programming decision, we had no idea that planet Earth would be placed under strict stay-at-home orders. But the timing turned out to actually be very good. We gave you 14 reviews per week, right? And uh, that was two a day every day for two months during a time where you guys were actually looking for a lot of content to read. So it kind of worked out. Right. And we've eaten up our backlog. And now it's down to a reasonable level. So beginning in May, we're going to scale back and go to new reviews every morning at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time seven days a week. It's still way more content than you are getting from any other vintage fiction blog on the internet. Yeah. Meanwhile, at 2 p.m. every day, I'm going to be doing a social media posting pointing you to reviews from our archives that you may have missed. It's going to be our greatest hits. Our archives are pretty deep at this point with like over 800 book reviews by Eric and I. And so I'm betting that you can point you to some pretty cool books and some reviews that you haven't read. Um, That should keep you busy during the month of May, especially if you live somewhere that's going to require additional social distancing that month, uh, we're not going to leave you hanging. Speaking of traffic, you and I had a Paperback Warrior Board of Directors meeting the other night. Yeah, it ended up being a nice conversation. I had a good time talking to you on the phone for like two hours. Uh, We ended up uh, chatting about books as we were talking about different formatting changes to the website and future programming for the podcast. It occurred to me that we probably should have just been recording that conversation for a podcast episode. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But but, but the conversation actually got me thinking, I I wonder if our listeners would be interested in a peek behind the curtain regarding our traffic numbers. I listen to a lot of podcasts and I read a lot of book blogs and I have no idea idea if there are millions of fans or if I'm the only one. And I see no reason why we shouldn't just be transparent. Right. I agree. Uh, Paperback Warrior isn't a moneymaker for us. We don't sell ads. There's no reason to be coy or cagey about our modest success. We're basically doing the show for free with no listeners back when we used to just get together and talk about books. The only thing different now is that we run a recorder as we do it. So, Tom, let's look at the numbers. All right. Okay. So let's start with social media. We have about 2,200 followers on Facebook. I, now, I hate Instagram because it's all about the covers there, but we do have 2,300 followers on Instagram, and I have no feel for if that ends up helping the blog or the podcast because Instagram doesn't really allow followers to click through to the paperbackwarrior.com website. Now, you manage our Twitter account. What, what's that like? Well, last I checked, Paperback Warrior on Twitter has slightly over 1,500 followers. Okay, good. So our, uh, our social media coverage is solid. I, I, I have no problem with that, and I think that's something we can be proud of. Um, I follow the traffic on the blog pretty closely as far as what articles are getting read. And that seems to swing pretty wildly depending on what we're reviewing. The reviews with the most salacious cover art makes people click through to the review itself. And most of our readers are finding us through our social media platforms. So a normal day on the blog will have 600 to 700 visitors. 
a bad day will be about 400 visitors and a good day will be about a thousand visitors. And I got to say, since the coronavirus uh, quarantines and social distancing and all that, we've had a lot of good days lately. It's been uh, pretty, we've been hitting pretty big numbers. Now you actually ran the numbers on the podcast and uh, on how many listeners we have. What, what'd you find? Well, it's a little tricky to tabulate because you need to add up all the ways that somebody can listen to the episode, right? Uh, we stream it on the website, but a lot of people like to download the episode and they listen to it offline. There's also podca- podcast apps like iTunes, uh, Spotify, uh, Google Play, and uh, Stitcher. The podcast is also on YouTube without any video content. And people still discover the show and listen to old episodes because we try to keep things evergreen. But all in, it looks like we have about 350 listeners per episode. So at first, that number seemed small to me as we were kind of running those numbers. And then I thought, you know what? If we could fill an auditorium every week with 350 people, week after week after week, and have people listen to us talk about paperbacks, I'd be thrilled with that audience. We would be like a a live show hit. So I can totally live with 350 loyal fans every time we uh, record a show. That that seems like a decent accomplishment to me and a number that we can be proud of. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we can't get our own household to meet us in the living room to talk about books. So 350 <laughs> people is fantastic. <laughs> exactly. Like you said earlier, talking about books together is something we'd be doing anyway. So the fact that anyone has any interest in listening to us is still pretty flattering to me. Yeah, me too. So I want to thank you guys for being listeners. If you care about the show or you want to spread the word, you know, share our post with somebody who might find it interesting. But if you don't, that's fine. We're just happy to have a small club of 350 uh, people, men and women, who like to listen to what we do. So why don't you go on and do your feature? All right. Today's feature is on a Canadian-American author named Kenneth Millar. Now, most people don't recognize that name. Instead, Millar became a literary bestseller and household name using the pseudonym Ross MacDonald. As MacDonald, Millar created a private detective named Lou Archer, which to this day still remains an iconic literary character. Now, Millar grew up in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada, but was originally born in California in 1915. His father died when he was at an early age, so he grew up fatherless and poor. Millar admitted that he had lost his virginity at the age of 8, gotten drunk at the age of 12, and was constantly fighting or stealing. But Millar eventually stopped breaking laws. He went on to graduate from the University of Michigan. Before joining the U.S. Naval Reserve in 1944, Millar met and married popular writer Margaret Sturm. Now, Sturm would go on to author a number of mysteries as Margaret Millar, including the Paul Pry, the Inspector Sands, and the Tom Aragon mystery series. Tom, she was a pretty big deal. Now, Kenneth Millar first began publishing his short stories in the 1930s in magazines like The Grumbler, Saturday Night, and American Mercury. But it was in the military that Millar penned his first full-length novel, 1944's The Dark Tunnel, which was also known as I Die Slowly. He would go on to write four crime fiction novels in the 1940s under the name Ken Millar. But Millar's biggest stepping stone was a 1946 short story called Find the Woman, published by Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine under the name Ken Millar. This short introduced readers to a West Coast private eye named Lou Archer. Millar would utilize the Archer character in his 1949 novel entitled The Moving Target. Upon its first publication, The Moving Target featured the author's name as John MacDonald. Miller chose the name because he wanted to avoid confusion with his successful wife Margaret Millar's career. Makes sense. Well, yes yes and no, right? Choosing the name John McDonald (laughs) that year opens up a whole other can of worms, which I'm sure you're going to touch upon. Go ahead. Yeah, obviously John D. McDonald became one of the best-selling authors in crime fiction. (laughs) So Millar briefly changed the name to John Ross McDonald before finally and thankfully choosing the name Ross McDonald. From the mid-1950s onward, Ross McDonald was the primary name used. It reminds when I see McDonald and I see Marlowe, it always confuses me on bookshelves. It does. And here's I've heard this story before, right? That that Ross McDonald fans and Ross McDonald himself maintained that that this was all perfectly innocent. But what no one is failing to recognize here is that John D. McDonald was an incredibly popular author in the pulps 
He had like a thousand stories under his own name. So the idea that Kenneth Millar just happened to stumble right. upon the name John McDonald with no intention of creating confusion in the marketplace seems unlikely to me. But I'm, you know, I don't know the guy, and he's probably, a, and he's certainly a good author. He's a good and honorable man. He doesn't certainly doesn't need to steal um, John D. McDonald's shine, but. I just can't believe that this was an honest mistake. Right. But, well, this is just me being a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Go ahead, man. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, it's okay. Uh, McDonald authored 18 total novels and a number of short stories starring Lou Archer. The series began with the uh, aforementioned The Moving Target, which I'm going to review later in the show. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Many literary scholars agree that Lou Archer is the second coming of Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe. There's some differences in the two with Archer being... I don't know, a more sensitive spectator and Marlowe portraying more of the tough guy persona. Archer's investigative work is in the suburbs of Los Angeles. Marlowe was patrolling the city. And as the Archer series continued, more and more of those hard-boiled trappings were released. Uh, The character's history suggests that Archer was trained by the Long Beach, California Police Department, but he was terminated or he left due to much uh, corruption. Uh, in the moving target, readers learn that Archer is divorced and apparently spent time in the military. In the series' seventh installment, The Doomsters from 1958, more of Archer's military service is disclosed, including a fact that he worked in military intelligence for the U.S. Army. Now, like most detective novels of this time period, the Lou Archer novels can be read in any order. There are only a handful of recurring characters, two of which are Arnie and Phyllis Walters. Now, Arnie is a private detective in Nevada that sometimes helps Archer with cases in and around Las Vegas. Beginning with The Moving Target, the series ran 18 installments and finalized with 1976's The Blue Hammer. But most people don't realize that while these books were popular, Ross MacDonald didn't necessarily become a household name until the early 1970s. Newsweek did a cover on MacDonald in 1971, and Tom, his books, exploded off the shelf shortly thereafter. He was also spotlighted on the front page of the New York Times book review. Now, there were three films, two of which are based on the series' first two installments. There's 1966's Harper, which is based on the series' debut, The Moving Target, and features Paul Newman playing Archer. Only his name was changed from Archer to Harper in the film. Also, the location was moved to Louisiana instead of Los Angeles. I mean, at least they got the abbreviations right. The story right? I heard was that Paul Newman had a series of um, of movies around that window of time where he always played characters. His name began with H, and he was a little oh. – and so he <laughs> demanded that change uh, to uh, from Archer to Harper because he was like on a roll. And maybe ah, he was superstitious. Okay. And that may just be Hollywood legend nonsense, but that Who was knows? the story I was told. Paul Newman reprised his role in the series' second adaptation, The Drowning Pool, in 1975 – which was based on the novel of the same name. I used to always think that the Drowning Pool uh, novel was the was the was portrayed by Clint Eastwood in the Drowning Pool movie, but that was actually a Dirty Harry movie, not to be confused. Uh, in 1974, there was a television film made titled The Underground Man. It starred Peter Graves as Archer and was based on the 1971 novel of the same name. Now, a short-lived television series called Archer was launched in 1975. The NBC show featured Brian Keith as Archer. It was canceled after only six episodes. Also, there were two radio teleplays, uh, The Sleeping Beauty and The Zebra-Striped Hearse. Now, McDonald's 1947 standalone novel, Blue City, was adapted to cinema in 1986, and it won five Razzies. Tom, remind me to watch that movie. I love bad cinema. I think you do, too. <laughs> no, I like, good, I like good movies. I just I happen like to them. stumble upon bad movies too, way too much. <laughs> I can sit through a bad movie. I can't finish a bad book. Ah, okay, gotcha. Well, his 1960 uh, standalone novel, The Ferguson Affair, was adapted into a television movie in 1992. Now, according to an NPR interview, Millar stated that the detective story was a kind of welder's mask enabling writers to handle dangerously hot material. While others were combing asphalt jungles... Millar was able to find the mysteries within the suburbs of mortgaged families. Now, again, I'm going to review the moving target later in the show, but I wanted to briefly talk about my experience with Millar's standalone crime fiction novel, Meet Me at the Morgue. Is that okay with you, Tom? Yeah, do that. I want to hear more about his standalones. Okay. I've I've read a couple of Lou Archer books. I like them, but I have not explored his standalone books, and I have several lying around. Okay, cool. So, Meet Me at the Morgue, also known as Experience with Evil, was written under the John McDonald name and published in 1953. 
To break the constraints of the detective model, McDonald's concept was to create an everyman hero that solved these crimes in California. It was paralleling McDonald's Archer character, only this time using a parole officer in lieu of a detective. I'm not sure if that idea sparked any new ideas uh, for the author. Apparently, the publisher couldn't find enough variation to really create another series. Hence, Meet Me at the Morgue is just a standalone novel. The book places parole officer Howard Cross into the mix of a complex ransom plot involving a wealthy family son. Cross's own parole client, a guy named Fred Miner, is the prime suspect, and his last known appearance was with the child. However, Cross primarily wants to defend the man, despite Miner's prior conviction of manslaughter. When a ransom note arrives asking for the payout, Cross teams with the FBI and police in trailing the money. Now, here's where it gets crazy. When the ransom funds are stolen from the instructed destination, the crime then splits into two sections. They have to find the kidnapper, but they also have to find out who stole the ransom money from the kidnapper. At the standard 170th pages, the crime novel worked well, despite the large cast of characters. It can really be dense in spots, which provoked me to even use a pad and pen to note how the characters related to each other. I found Cross to be a capable, well-suited problem solver, but there's a real messy point in the finale that just left me a little bit bitter. What year was it written again? Uh, This was uh, written in 1953. Okay. Uh, Despite the flaws, I think it was a really good book, and it's a great introduction to McDonald's writing if you aren't reading an Archer title first. Now, in closing, Kenneth Millar slash Ross McDonald wrote nearly 25 full-length novels altogether, lots of short stories. Now, later in life, he suffered from Alzheimer's, and he died in 1983 at the age of 67. Now, you can take your pick on biographies and nonfiction books dedicated to Millar's writing career. There are a ton out there. It can be a really deep dive down the rabbit hole in terms of looking at social subtext within his writing style. For this segment, I want to thank the Thrilling Detective site, as well as the New York Times for making their feature on Millar free online. Those really aided in my research on this author. But uh, that wraps up my feature on uh, this author. Tom, do you have... Uh, yeah, a couple, a couple yeah. of postscripts. So okay. the John D. McDonald throughout his entire career was driven crazy by the fact that Ross McDonald was out there using the, even the McDonald name as a pseudonym. In fact, at one point, as the legend goes, John D. McDonald's mom goes out to the bookstore to buy her son's latest book and ends up picking up um, 1966's Black Money uh, because again, the Travis McGee books were all color coded. Oh, okay. Right, and so uh, <laughs> and so John D. McDonald snaps and writes this really pissy letter to Ross McDonald or Ken, Ken Millar, basically saying like, you know, enough's enough here. Like, you know, uh, you know, you, at first you started out as John McDonald. Now you're Ross McDonald. Now you're writing books that are color coded, and and wow. it, and that letter is available on the internet. If you just Google it, you can find it. Um, if you ask, remind me sometime, and I'll email it to you. I got it on some hard drive somewhere, but it's just it's, it's a man. <laughs> who's at the end of his rope because his own mother is buying the other guy's books. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Uh, That's it, yeah. Until we move on to the uh, moving target. Okay, why don't I do my review first, and then we can go back and do moving target. My book I'm reviewing is called A Rage at Sea by Frederick Lorenz. Lorenz is spelled L-O-R-E-N-Z, and it's actually a pseudonym uh, by a guy named Lawrence Heller, who was born in 1911. I, I can't figure out when he died, so hopefully he's alive and well and listening right now. Um, he wrote a handful of paperback crime novels from Lion Books in the 1950s. And the Rage at Sea has been reprinted or is being reprinted in May. It's a double when Starkhouse releases it, along with Lawrence's A Party Every Night. And uh, it has this really interesting introduction by Nicholas Littlefield. It comes out in May. You can pre-order it on Amazon by clicking through the Paperback Warrior review. The protagonist of A Rage at Sea is this Miami drunkard named Frank Dixon. He's a former boat captain who lost his ship in a poker game, and now he's in the process of drinking himself to death as we meet him. Out of nowhere, this opportunity arises for Dixon to captain a rich man's yacht on a four-month cruise through the Bahamas and into the Virgin Islands. So he's broke and he's in need of a change in his life, so he accepts the gig. The owner of the boat is this obese and lazy millionaire playboy named Charles Allard, who doesn't know the first thing about boating. 
He relies on his uh, right-hand man, Mr. Adams, uh, who's like the purser, cook, and steward. This Adams guy, though, is also a con man who's like fueled by greed and love of money, and he's ripping off Allard every day of the journey. Now, Dixon's the only um, like reasonable person on this boat. He has this reliable ally, though, who's this young engineer named Wirtz. So there's really four characters to keep track of the entire book. Now, many authors of nautical fiction fall into this trap of getting super technical uh, with their level of boating detail in the narrative, but Lawrence never even fell into that literary pitfall, so it was pretty easy to read. And nearly the entire first half of the paperback was at sea, and the reader's able to follow the action without any trouble because the author really made the narrative about these four main characters. In fact, I can't recall, Eric, a lean crime paperback from the 1950s with better character development than A Rage at Sea. But ha- halfway through the novel, and I'm not spoiling anything because it's in every synopsis on the cover, it's um, an accident. It leads the four stranded on a deserted Caribbean island. Uh, and um, it's then that the slow burn of a novel really begins to boil a bit. But it still remains essentially a character drama with these shifting alliances among the four characters and resentment simmering from their time at sea together. Uh, the bad blood and bruised egos evolve into threats of violence and, and real violence eventually, and act some actual heroism. It rages sees not particularly action packed, but the author's excellent writing just kept the pages flying by. It's it's an odd book. It's a little more cerebral than most of the paperbacks of its type. I was kind of surprised to find it was a Lion Books release. Uh, but Dixon is such a great character. He's very flawed, but he's logical, mostly honorable, highly competent. He, he's exactly the kind of guy you'd want to be stranded on a deserted island with because you know he's going to get you off in one piece. I, I really liked Rage at Sea. I thought it was a great book. Um, but I could see it being polarizing for readers who want a little more action and kind of swashbuckling stuff in their maritime adventures. But I recommend it. Again, the book is A Rage at Sea by Frederick Lawrence, and it's available on Starkhouse. So why don't you do your review now? Okay, great. So my uh, review this week is a book called The Moving Target, originally published in 1949 under the name John MacDonald. Of course, this was an author named Kenneth Millar, who would later use the name Ross MacDonald for the bulk of his literary work. As MacDonald, the author's most coveted and celebrated work is the Lou Archer series of private detective novels. Like an uncanny second coming of Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, MacDonald sculpted Archer as a studious, more sensitive California sleuth. While equally tough with guns and fists, Archer's procedural style is in stark contrast to the air's most iconic private eye. That was a guy named Mike Hammer. The book begins with Archer's arrival in a posh suburb in the fictional California city of Santa Teresa, which is probably Santa Barbara. Archer has been hired by a woman named Mrs. Sampson to locate her missing husband, Ralph. The family is old money with Ralph making a fortune in oil and real estate, and Mrs. Sampson seemingly indifferent to where, when, and how her husband spends his free time. After the initial meeting, Archer is introduced to Ralph's gorgeous 20-year-old daughter, Miranda, and his personal pilot, Taggart. Now, Archer also reunites with an old friend named Graves, who is a former district attorney who now specializes in private practice. Now, Archer's procedural investigation leads to Las Vegas through a criminal named Troy. Now, both Ralph and Troy had some sort of business relationship, and Archer feels that Troy could be a suspect in Ralph's disappearance. But like most genre works, the idea of magically solving the mystery is way more complex. A ransom note appears demanding $100,000 for Ralph's safe delivery. Entwined in the ransom attempt is this washed-up singer named Betty and a declining actress named Faye. Archer teams with Graves to successfully deliver the ransom money, but ends up with a corpse, which elevates the mystery to murder. There's a lot to unpack in Millar's debut Archer novel. While my synopsis might be muddied, trust me, it's for your own good. This is a complex but enthralling narrative that showcases Millar's private eye as a determined, thinking man's hero who isn't easily swayed into fisticuffs. The mystery was complex. It had a number of possible leads and directions that all circulate around San- uh, Ralph's uh, disappearance. Archer's centralized, but the cast of characters helped bulk up Millar's prose. Two hot-blooded female performers, a strong man pilot, the complacent attorney, and Ralph's rather eccentric family. Without the dynamic supporting cast, I think The Moving Target would be a wholly different novel, albeit I still think it would be a very good one. While The Moving Target is technically a 1940s private eye novel, 
It should appeal, appeal to fans of 1950s crime noir and hardboiled crime. It feels a bit more modern than, say, I, the Jury, the runaway bestseller that placed detective fiction at new heights of popularity in 1947. In addition, Millar's use of California's rolling seaside hills, I thought, provided a lot of literary space than, say, you know, mundane urban settings like New York City. Archer thrives as a suburban detective, and the author's descriptive usage of the surroundings played key parts in the book's climactic scenes. Now, here's where things are, gets a little confusing. The Moving Target was also released later under the name Harper. This was a marketing strategy to coincide with a 1966 movie of the same name. That film was based on The Moving Target and cast Paul Newman as Lou Harper. The filmmakers changed the name from Archer to Harper and also switched the location from Los Angeles to Louisiana. Uh, as Tom mentioned earlier in the feature, that could have been uh, based on Paul Newman's uh, choice. But Tom, overall, The Moving Target by Ross MacDonald deserves the heaps of praise it's received over the decades. I thought it was a really smart, fast-paced novel, and I thought it was symbolic of the transition from the hard-boiled tough guys of the 40s into the softer, more socially conscious detective. And you and I talked about that a few weeks ago, and I think this book solidifies some of those talking points we made um, a couple weeks ago in our discussion. That sounds good. I, I had actually read this one years ago before I started writing for Paperback Warrior. I did not like it as much as you did, but I thought some of the later Lou Archer ones were just outstanding. I, I remember reading The Blue Hammer when I was in college, and it was fantastic. So. Okay, good. So I'll have those to look forward to. Uh, during the time we have left, we should wrap up the month of April, I think. Tom, what are some of the best books you read and reviewed this month at uh, the blog? All right, let me give you three. Um, for, I read and reviewed a great book by Lawrence Block called Cinderella Sims. It, it, the beginning of his career, Lawrence Block was barely making a living writing uh, pretty readable paperbacks for sleaze paperback publishing houses. In 1958, he wrote a book published by Nightstand called $20 Lust under the pseudonym of Andrew Shaw. Nightstand later re recycled the novel as Cinderella Sims, a title that stuck for reprints under Block's own name. It's available now as a reprint title on his own publishing imprint for his historical oddities. It's about basically a short order cook in New York who becomes in fact with a girl who lives across the street and basically starts stalking her. Her name is Cinderella, or Cindy Sims. Without spoiling too much, it's this sexy crime novel involving a crew of con artists, a casino gambling scam, and a satchel full of cash. With those ingredients, Lawrence Block driving the narrative, and you're in, for good, you're in good hands. There's, there's nothing not to like about this book, Cinderella Sims. You can check out my review at paperbackwarrior.com. I also read and enjoyed a 1960 paperback that really hasn't seen the light of day in 60 years. It's called Hell Can Wait by Harry Whittington. It's a, about a, the narrator is this guy named Greg Morris. He's come to this backwoods town of Coons Mills to settle a score. Uh, years ago, his wife was killed in a car accident caused by the town's boss, Mr. Saul Coons. At a subsequent civil trial, Coons arranged for false testimony to get himself off the hook and convince the court that the accident was all Greg's fault. After spending a year away mourning the loss of his wife, Greg gets back into Coons Mills, hell-bent on justice. It's kind of a slow burn of a novel, but I found it very compelling. It's more of a mainstream revenge story than normal crime fiction paperback. Um, the ending was just pure noir, but I'm not going to spoil that here or in my review on the on the site. Some of the characters act extremely odd until the twisting and the twisty ending explains it all. At no point did I ever know where the plot was headed, and that's saying a lot in a genre that usually sticks to pretty rigid formulas. So, and you should definitely check out Hell Can Wait. You shouldn't pay a fortune for it. It's kind of a, just an interesting puzzle box of a. Um, vintage paperback it's not quite top tier harry whittington but it'll certainly be on your mind long after you finish the 144 pages the best book i read in april is called all i can get it's the first book in the lou largo series by william ard it's a private eye story from 1959 and i'm going to be reviewing it in greater depth next week's show so i'm not gonna um i'll reserve my comments till then but uh, you can jump the gun if you want and read my review that posted on paperbackwarrior.com on April 15. So, Eric, what did you like in April? Well, interesting. I picked a Lawrence Block book as well. Oh. And then I also picked a 1960 novel. Uh, so Small world. <laughs> yeah, so we'll start with the 1960 novel. It was written by Charles Williams, and it's called A Ground. This is one of the author's nautical suspense works and features a boat appraiser named John Egram that is hired to locate a stolen boat off of Key West. The boat owner's widow is a woman named Ray. In an exciting sequence of events, Ingram and Ray find the boat, but become captives to a trio of thieves. It's a really tight suspense thriller. It was the first of two novels to feature these two characters. 
The other was 1963's Dead Calm, which was adapted to the big screen in 1989, starring Nicole Kidman and Sam Neill. Did you ever see that? I didn't see the movie. It's great. Yeah. It's really good. Like it's a, it's not like good for an old movie. It's just good. Yeah, I'd like to check it out. Yeah. Uh, another one that was really impressive this month was the uh, Lawrence Block book that I read. It was the second Matthew Scudder novel. It's called A Time to Murder and Create. It was published in 1977. In it, a man named Spinner gives a sealed envelope to Scudder and asks him to open it if he dies. Spinner was a criminal informant that Scudder used when he was in law enforcement. So Spinner's corpse is eventually fished out of the river, and Scudder then opens the envelope. He finds that Spinner was blackmailing three separate individuals. He's also left $3,000 in the envelope, and on a handwritten note, he says that one of those three people killed him, and he wants Scudder to locate which one. The book's narrative explores Scudder's investigation into these three individuals' histories and what sins they committed that led them to being blackmailed by Spinner. Tom, it was a fantastic novel. I think you've read this. Uh, yeah, I read I read all the Scudder books. Yeah. I did it sort of differently. I remember getting a, a copy of A Ticket to the Boneyard at the American Booksellers Association convention in the late 80s. I read that, fell in love with it, and I read every new Scudder book that came out until the, this very day. A new one came out just uh, in December. Um, in order, but also I was reading them backwards. Um, oh, okay. And so uh, it was just kind of a fun way to read the series. You can read them in any order, but uh, his um, he, one, he gets younger as you read backwards, and right. two, he gets less sober as you read them backwards. <laughs> but yeah, that's probably one of my favorite series of all times. And uh, yeah, I, I just I trust me, I don't have enough good things to say about Lawrence Block. The guy's amazing. Okay. Uh, well, the last one I picked uh, was Robert B. Parker's Spencer series. It was the third book in that series called Mortal Stakes. It was published in 1975. In this novel, Spencer is hired by the general manager of the Boston Red Sox. Of course, this is a fictional Boston Red Sox team to investigate their star pitcher. He believes uh, the pitcher is throwing games for a gambling racket and wants Spencer to find out if that is the case. Readers follow Spencer as he tracks down the pitcher's wife and her mysterious past. It leads to some pretty dark avenues. This third installment also shifts Spencer's character into a more violent, darker character. I absolutely love this book. I think our listeners should pursue it, as well as all these great April selections we've made. Um, but that's really, yeah, that's my, those are my three picks. You just read your third Spencer novel, and we're coming off a situation right now where all of America is locked inside with nothing but paperbacks and Netflix to keep them company. Have you watched the Spencer movie starring Mark Wahlberg on Netflix? No, let me say that I've read uh, now the first three novels of the Spencer series. Uh, so I'm not a uh, you know a Spencer long term fan. I'm I'm kind of new to the series, but I haven't watched that, nor have I watched the uh, television show Spencer for Hire with Robert York. Yeah, I've never seen an episode of that either. Do you, knowing what you know about Mark Wahlberg and having read the first three books, do you think it's good casting? No, and I think a lot of Spencer fans um, really uh, hate the fact that he's been cast as uh, Spencer. The way that I picture Spencer is a uh, a guy wearing blue jeans and a sports jacket who's the sort of Ivy League detective. Uh, he likes to uh, cook. He likes to prepare meals. He uh, he drinks Amstel beer. So he's not like a bruiser. He's not a real bulky guy. He runs. He lifts weights. He used to box. Um, he can do one-arm push-ups, but he's not a real husky guy. He's not quick to the gun. He doesn't get in a lot of fights. He uses his... Uh, well, he, he's kind of like Lou Archer in a way. He, he, now, uh, ha- has his badass African-American sidekick Hawk been introduced into the series by book three? No, he has oh, not. Oh, really? Interesting. Uh, yeah, Hawk has not um, made an appearance at all. And I will say, by the end of Mortal Stakes, this third novel, Spencer changes quite a bit. I'm not going to ruin it for anyone, but the, the last few chapters of that book turn really, really dark. And Spencer may or may not have started to morph into more of what Mark Wahlberg is trying to portray, but I still think it's a horrible, horrible uh, casting choice. So you've told me, uh, both on the show and, and I've read your reviews, you love those first three Spencer books. Is there any desire whatsoever to see Spencer Confidential on Netflix, <laughs> or are you just sort of, just out of as an oddity or a curiosity or you just like want to stay as far away from it as possible yeah i'll stay as far away as possible in fact when i read the first spencer book last year i had no interest in tracking down spencer for hire and i think robert b parker i probably got the story wrong but he says that that show when he was writing the spencer novels 
had more to do with Spencer than the NFL Super Bowl. Uh, you know, he he just he just he said he just wasn't interested at all in the show. He didn't didn't pay any attention to it. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure it put a new deck on his house. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. All right. Well, I yeah. think that's our time for this week. Uh, please join us next week for another episode of the podcast and for new reviews every single day at paperbackwarrior.com. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>